Hello, seventh grade. A crusader walks into a bar. The bartender asks, what will you take? The crusader says, Jerusalem. That was so dumb. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, okay. Here's a better one. Why does a crusader need to have a kitchen sink? To wash his salad in. That one's a good one. Remember Saladin? He was uh, the leader of uh, Islamic, the Islamic military forces. He's the leader of the caliphate during one of the crusades. I forget which one. Anyways, uh, I thought that was funny. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we left off talking a little bit about the Crusades. So remember, the Crusades were waged against uh, the Seljuk Turks in the First Crusade. And then there's a series of Crusades after that that were waged against uh, different people. So we're going to get to the Crusades later in the chapter. Uh, but yesterday I was mostly focusing on why the First Crusade occurred. And this is because the Byzantine emperor was fearful of the Seljuk Turks uh, and the abuse that they were waging on Christians and Jews, not only in Jerusalem, but also in the areas around in Constantinople. Remember the Seljuk Turks were also threatening to conquer Constantinople, which they did with the aid of uh, explosive cannonballs, which was a new type of weaponry that had never been used before. They caused the walls of Constantinople to fall Right. So anyways, Pope Urban II uh, gives uh, financial and social and spiritual incentives for Christian kings and nobles and knights and really any Christian men in Europe to travel to Jerusalem to recapture the Holy Land from the Seljuk Turks. And the First Crusade is temporarily successful. They succeed in recapturing Jerusalem, although they're going to lose it just a few years later. Uh, so we also talked about some of the effects of the Crusades, right? So there's a lot of uh, negative consequences of the Crusades. They were a really big mess um, in, the, in that a lot of the Crusaders were uh, very violent. They, they tortured, they killed, they pillaged. Um, and not just the enemy, oftentimes anyone who they met along the path who was not a Christian, that's what they did. Uh, and the Crusades also made a lot of bad people very powerful because the way you become wealthy by crusading is not by going over there fighting and surviving and returning. The way you become wealthy is by taking possessions from those you conquer along the way. So they were uh, raiding villages and towns along the way that were not Christian, and they were taking stuff from them. Right? So a lot of people became very wealthy and powerful because of it. So those are negative effects. Positive effects, yesterday I talked about the fact that the Mediterranean uh, trade uh, had a resurgence. Um, so Europe became very well connected with other parts of the world, especially Africa and Asia in the Middle East. Um, and in addition to just economic growth, there was intellectual growth as well, because in coming in contact with other civilizations, uh, Christendom acquired Islamic knowledge about medicine, for example, and about mathematics and about the nature of the the cosmos and things like this um, greatly improved quality of life inside of Europe. All right. So meanwhile, the Crusades are going on. Now we're going to zoom in on one effect of the Crusades in England. So in England, uh, while the Crusades were going on, a lot of the nobles were away fighting the Crusades. And meanwhile, King John is basically warring with his nobles. So King John, during the Crusades, decides it'd be a good idea to try to recapture uh, some of Normandy for England. Normandy exists in the, the northern border of modern-day France. 
and the English crown believed that it had a legitimate claim to the lands in Normandy, right? And so King John kept trying to use military force to acquire Normandy for England, uh, but he kept losing. And he kept asking his soldiers for more and more money and uh, his nobles for more and more soldiers and more and more money in order to fund these skirmishes, these battles that he was losing. And basically the nobles got fed up and said no. And so King John responded by raising taxes on everyone. And this made the nobles really, really mad, right? Because they thought King John sucks at fighting wars. Uh, whenever we give him soldiers, whenever we give him tax money, he just flushes it away on these battles in Normandy that he always loses. We don't want to pay this. Right? So King John was aware that his nobles were starting to grumble against him, and he actually started to go to war against several of his nobles who had kind of united against him. Right? Um, meanwhile, King John is also facing a lot of pressure from the church and from Pope Urban II. Right? We don't need to get into the reasons that Pope Urban II was mad at King John. Um, but basically, there is a threat that the combined power of the nobles and the church would overthrow John from the throne of England, right? And so John realizes that he's in a lot of trouble here and that he's basically kind of overstepped his bounds in taxing these nobles. He's doing a lot of stuff that the church doesn't like either. And so the nobles and the church together work on a document called Magna Carta, and they basically give King John an ultimatum. They say, if you don't sign this, we're going to go to war against you and we're going to overthrow you. And the Catholic Church is not going to have your side. Right? So King John reluctantly agrees to sign Magna Carta as a way to basically preserve his kingship. Now, Magna Carta is a very uh, short document. I've actually taken a class on Magna Carta when I was in law school. I, I saw some of the earliest copies of it. I got to study them. It's kind of cool. Um, and so, you know, you read the whole thing. And basically, Magna Carta is a list of limitations on the power of the monarchy, right? Uh, so Magna Carta is important because it limits the power of the monarchy in Europe. And this is going to have permanent effects on how the monarchies of Europe function. It's going to significantly weaken the monarchies of Europe. And it's going to increase the power of the nobles. And it's also going to increase the power of the church. And finally, it's going to uh, protect the rights of individual citizens against the monarchy as well. All right, so Magna Carta does a few things. I've highlighted four things it does here. Number one, it says the king is not above the church, and therefore he cannot tax the church. Right? He has to recognize the authority of the bishops, uh, even if he doesn't agree with them. Right? So basically, King John is no longer allowed to go around taxing bishops, taxing churches, taxing monasteries and convents. He can't do that. Likewise, if the bishops speak up against him, King John can't really do anything about it, right? Especially if it's uh, a spiritual matter, right? The bishops have spiritual authority over the king. So that's one thing it does. Number two, it says everyone has to follow the law, even the king. So the king is not allowed to break the law. Now this matters because it suggests that the law does not actually come from the king. Prior to Magna Carta, people believed that the law came from the king and the king came from God. After Magna Carta, it was believed, okay, the king comes from God, but the law comes from God too. And the law is actually higher than the king. So the king has to obey the law. Number three, it says that the king is not allowed to tax his nobles without a council of nobles approving the taxes first, right? So this is like the early form of a Congress or a parliament. Right? You're not allowed to pass taxes unilaterally. You have to get the approval of nobles. Number four, it says the courts cannot imprison people for no reason. So the king can't just say, uh, Vanessa Lund, I don't like you. You're under arrest. And Vanessa's like, but I didn't do anything. Why are you arresting me? Right? It used to be that the king could just arrest whoever he wanted for no reason and didn't have to tell people why. Now it says if 
the king or anyone is going to arrest anyone. Uh, these prisoners have rights, right? Uh, if you're accused of a crime, uh, the courts, the king, the sheriff who arrests you, the jailer, they have to follow rules. They can't just do whatever you they want just because you're arrested. You actually have to be accused of a crime. You have to have a trial, things like that. All right. So what's interesting about Magna Carta, I think also, is that right after King John signed Magna Carta, the church and the nobles kind of backed off because they got what they wanted. And then right away, King John just started breaking all the rules that Magna Carta set on. Right. So King John obviously did not intend to keep his word with regards to Magna Carta, right? And this caused wars later on against King John. So King John was a very unpopular king in the history of Europe, in part because he sucked at waging war and he raised taxes a lot. In fact, um, Prince John from the animated Robin Hood movie is actually uh, based on King John of England, right? That that uh, like lion guy who just taxes everybody and then Robin Hood robs from him all the time, right? That guy is based on King John, the real King John. Uh, so he's a very unpopular king. All right. Uh, so now we are officially in section one, right? So everything we've done up to this point is basically an introduction to the chapter. Now we're officially on section one. So a lot of this is going to be a review. A lot of this is going to be new. Uh, I'm just going to blaze through the, the review stuff. So Charlemagne, remember, uh, Frankish leader, he wants to establish a Frankish Christian empire throughout Europe. In order to do this, he gets the support of the Pope. Uh, and the Pope decides that this is advantageous for the church as well as for Charlemagne. So in order to support Charlemagne, the Pope crowns Charlemagne emperor. Right? The Pope says, you know what, Charlemagne, uh, I like what you're doing. I am going to come over to you and I am going to crown you emperor. Right? Now, according to legend, Charlemagne didn't actually know that he was going to get crowned emperor. And that was like a big surprise to him. He probably did know in reality, but it doesn't really matter. So the Pope goes over to Charlemagne and in front of all of Charlemagne's nobles and a lot of people, the Pope crowns Charlemagne emperor. Now, at the time, there's already an emperor, the Byzantine emperor. And the Byzantine emperor hears that Charlemagne gets crowned, and the Byzantine emperor is mad because he thinks that there should only be one emperor, the Byzantine emperor. And Charlemagne is now the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which is Christendom in Europe. Right? Now, why is this significant? Well, primarily because it sets something called a precedent. A precedent is a rule that you establish by doing something in the past. Uh, so this basically created a precedent that in order to be an emperor, you have to be crowned by the Pope, right? Otherwise you're not legit. So if you wanna claim your emperor, the Pope has to crown you. Now, why is it significant that the Pope crowns the emperor? Because it suggests that the emperor is the choice of God, right? That the emperor is emperor because God wants him to be. It's also significant because it shows that the emperor has to serve the Pope. Whoever places the crown on another person is in a position of authority over that person they are crowning, right? So the Pope has authority over Charlemagne. Now, during Charlemagne's time, he never really got into it in a negative way with Pope Leo III. They had a good relationship, and this is primarily because Charlemagne was a devout Catholic, right? So he believed that um, it was important, for example, that he and his nobles are holy, live holy, met, live holy, pious lives in service of God and the church, right? Likewise, Pope Leo wasn't really looking to take any power away from Charlemagne, so they got along pretty well. Um, also, Charlemagne had this tendency to every time he won a battle, he would thank God and he would thank the church. And the way he would thank the church would be like making donations to the church. He would build monasteries and convents. Charlemagne also required a lot of Christians in Europe. So, for example, he required that priests and monks uh, live according to the church law. So he really tightened the screws to make sure all these priests and monks and nuns 
are following the rule of St. Benedict if they're in monasteries, for example. 